the Friday, September 13th edition of the Clemson Dubcast. Second one this week, as usual, during the season. Hope everybody's had a great week, both decompressing from last week's domination of Texas A&M and also getting ready for a team that was on the wrong end of a domination against Maryland, Syracuse. Been a busy day at TigerIllustrated.com. Opened up with Friday's insider notes from Paul Strelo. Syracuse forecast is up, and then we're going to wrap it all up with the final word from yours truly. Also, yesterday posted the Thursday video review of the A&M game. Some interesting stuff there. Always fun to go back and, and uh, catch what you might not have catched during the actual game in live action. Title sponsor of the Clemson Dubcast, Harm Smith Arts and Hole Law Firm in downtown Greenville. They have been with us from the very beginning. Blake Smith has been a good friend of mine for years, dating back to the days when he taught a law class at Clemson with Terry Don Phillips. Also, Brooke Arch and Hold, major Clemson fans. The forte of their firm, which is at 15 Washington Park in Greenville, is medical negligence. They represent patients and their families in medical negligence actions. Also handle all sorts of other personal injury litigation. Free consultations. Harm Smith and Arch and Hold. Give them a call. 864-990 4581 or go to parmlaw.com. Want to welcome aboard to the podcast Black Acre Law Firm, sister law firm of Parm Smith and Archenhold in Greenville. Stuart James is a 1998 Clemson grad, big Clemson fan, just like the Parm Smith and Archenhold family. Black Acre gives you the representation you can depend on when you're on the home stretch, closing on your house. All those documents you're signing, all those technical aspects of it, the last thing you want is, is for something to go wrong at that point. Black Acre also provides services for wills, powers of attorney, durable, and health care. Don't put yourself and your family in a bad situation by not having these important documents. Call today for a consultation, 864-775-5400, or go to their website, blackacrelawfirm.com. That's B-L-A-C-K-A-C-R-E lawfirm.com. All right. Sometimes you plan your podcast guests weeks in advance. Other times, it just sort of happens spontaneously. I sat down the other night and watched... Not even planned, but just it was on. So I started watching it, the Bowden Dynasty on the ACC network, and could not take my eyes off of it. Just really, really powerful stuff in so many ways. So Thursday morning, sent an email out asking how I could learn more about it, talk to a producer or something. And uh, John Corey, the producer of the Bowden Dynasty, very quickly uh, got back to us. And earlier today, actually about 30 minutes ago, we were able to have a lengthy discussion with John from his offices in LA to talk about the Bowden Dynasty, a story of faith, family, and football. Hope you'll enjoy this as much as I did. Okay, joined by John Corey, producer of the Bowden Dynasty. John, welcome, and and what a delightful movie. And I'm not just saying that, I mean, I, I, I could not take my eyes off of it. I was captivated, and I know I'm not the only one who came away with that uh, with that feeling. Well, you you never tire of hearing that when you when you put something out, you you love to think that you can make that connection, and uh, you don't always know. But uh, we've already, we've had a feeling about this one since we started it because of uh because of Bobby Bowden and, and especially because of the crew that that we we uh we we assembled to put this film together everybody kind of bought in and uh and went went the extra mile we're going to get into the foundation of it in a minute but i just want to say like i i, I can't, i'm still trying to figure out precisely why i was i mean almost i mean goosebumps you know like i Part of it's probably nostalgia. I, I was never a Florida State fan, but of course, just being a college football fan, there's that. Having grown up around uh, watching those teams and knowing what it's all about. Number two, um, you just feel like you know Bobby Bowden, like I, almost like I guess he, he's around the same age as my grandparents. I just feel like I'm talking to my grandparents or listening mm-hmm. to them. And mm-hmm. then, and then there's the parallel with Dabo Sweeney and, and, and the way he has constructed his own uh, program, powerhouse program, and, of course, Brad Scott, who was featured in, in the film, was, was a part of that. And so wh- what's your – I mean, is that is that the common sort of response you've gotten, I guess, not just from Florida State people, but people in general, that it's just um, 
the nostalgia mixed with just how relatable Bobby Bowden was and is? I, yeah, I think you hit on everything. But but uh, beyond that, I mean, I, I just love a good story. Mm-hmm. Uh, I watched I watched yesterday uh, the team that saved Coach K. It was just a great story, and uh, and um, it seems like Bobby is almost the Forrest Gump of college football, and that he came in contact with so many people uh, throughout his career, and uh, in a, they, they came in and out of his doors, including Dabo Sweeney, and um, uh, so so to be able to uh, tap into some of those stories, and then kind of weave weave those together with Bobby's own there uh, his own biography. Um, and then I think a lot of it has to do with just what what really happened. You can't you can't write a better a better story uh, than him being bedridden as a child and not being able to leave his bed for a year and not being able to play football. So you know I remember reading that that passage in chapter two of his book um, called The Coach that came out I think it came out in 2010 2011 and uh, and I thought oh my gosh what this is a this is a movie and that's the from that from that moment I, I began thinking of uh, of how could I how could I put this put this on put this together yeah okay um, you went to Florida State eighty to eighty four is that correct. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. And so, just give give everybody just a synopsis of your background, how you uh, your, your experience uh, in in the film industry, and all that. Just sort of how this came to be. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Went to Florida State. I, w- I majored in communications there. <clears throat> Was involved in the uh, student run television station there. We were the only. Um, show in the country that was produced entirely by students but then turned over to a commercial uh, station and where they sold the ad time for it usually most student-run tv uh, shows were done on a local pbs affiliate or something like that so that kind of gave me my start i was it was was in the uh, air force and as a captain was in combat camera and uh, learned the craft of 16 millimeter and uh and um uh, professional video production and then in 1990 got out and um and have been in commercial television and film production since. What are some of the some of the I guess things you've worked on? I guess that people might recognize. Uh, well, I did a lot of military documentaries: uh, uh, Brute Force, The History of Weapons of War, uh, sixty five hours for the his- for the A and E, uh, Sworn to Secrecy, Secrets of War with Charlton Heston on uh, the History Channel. Um, the Color of War with Peter Coyote, seventeen hours of World War Two in color on the history channel and uh, a feature film uh, the rundown was one that a lot of people know we were we owned the script to that uh, my partners and i uh, had the script to that and had that film made with the rock and and christopher walken and, and that was a lot of fun so and then recently since uh 2009 i've been doing a lot of uh feature documentary films that go to theaters first and they're typically for a passion audience Forks Over Knives, uh, Plant Pure Nation, Ayn Rand and the Prophecy of Atlas Shrugged, um, and you know, of course, the Bowden Dynasty. And each of these films has a passion audience that that's that's uh, very interested in the subject matter. So that that's usually the best way to do. If you're gonna if you're gonna put something together independently, the best thing you can have is a is an audience that's that's dying to see it. And you live in L.A. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, you mentioned uh, the book that came out in 2010, um, Mark Slayball, the noted um, ESPN writer. He's actually a good friend of mine. Uh, I was, it was cool to see you guys in his man cave uh, <laughs> interviewing him uh, for, you know, for his insight. And so so before you mentioned, I mean, Mark is so good at, at unearthing stuff that people either don't know or that... Um, Really, people haven't made enough of, I guess. And so, the what really, I guess, caught you and grabbed you was 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 uh, Coach Bowden's childhood, what he dealt with, is, and, and that had, I guess, that ground really hadn't been plowed yet at all, or, or uh, to an extent. Well, well, well that's right. It, well, it certainly hadn't been in documentary form. And further, no one had thought to make a documentary, or if they had, they just didn't do it, or or, or what have you. But uh, I just couldn't believe that when I did talk to Coach Bowden for the first time about this and about. I think it was around 2013 or so. Um, you know, I just kept thinking, why? I can't believe nobody else has seen this. Is low hanging fruit. This is an amazing story. This is an amazing individual who's who's accomplished so much. He's so colorful. 
uh, so popular. Where you know, where's the documentary? And it's just one of those things where, you know, for one reason or another, it's just one of those gaps that I was able to uh, to go in and, and fill. And um, and then, but you got to have a story. And and it's not just the child. It's the it's the uh, it's it's all the coincidences along the way. The fact that he was with Florida State as a wide receivers coach when they won the first game over Florida in 64. It's the fact that he, he suffered, you know, the going for two in 87 when he had a national championship in his hand, if he could have just kicked the field goal, but he went for two. And then the wide rights with, with Miami. Um, I, I, I suffer th- through all that as a fan as well. And, um, but it's one of those things that just made you tougher. The Seminole rap is one of those. It's just a life lesson. Uh, so putting it all together, and then with you, you with the biographies of Warwick Dunn and uh, Mark Richt and and um, uh, Chris Winkie, Charlie Ward, you can't make these stories up. You know, Charlie Ward is a roommate with with Warwick Dunn, so um, all of this was great, and it was all on paper. But um, I still had to figure out a way to make it. And I, at one point, I thought I would I would I was going to do the directing and the writing and the producing, and kind of make it my little magnum opus, my, you know, my passion project. Uh, but I've just been too busy. And uh, uh, but my wife encouraged me to figure another way out to do it. And and I was watching um, I was watching ESPN one night, and I saw I think I was watching the SEC Network, and I saw a documentary called Thunder and Lightning. And it was produced by Rob Harvell and Brian Goodwin. Rob's a producer, Brian's an editor, and they share a director credit. And I reached out to them because I really love their storytelling style. They also did uh, The Book of Manning. And uh, they bought in, and we figured out a way, well, hey, maybe these guys can do a lot of the, he- the heavy lifting. So I'll, I'll give them the story. I'll give them all the beats because I had written everything out, uh, how I thought the, the story would go. And then, But they had to do the interviews and do the editing and all that. So it, it just worked out. It worked out really well. They they not only bought in, but they, they put a lot of time into it. We, we spent more than we wanted to originally, both in terms of budget and time. But And we had captured around 60 interviews. And um, uh, it was originally it was originally uh, shown as a one night only Fathom event in 337 theaters all over the country, and uh, some of the clubs as far as Alaska were all getting together and watching this thing. And then mm. there was a lot of uh, there was a faith based uh, 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 crowd out there that got wind. It was a because Bobby's always uh, had never been shy about his faith, so we had a, we had a, a number of other people uh, coming fans to come see him for that reason as well. And, um, and then after that, we did some DVDs and then we, so we, we've been looking for a TV home and we decided to wait because ESPN offered us uh, the opportunity to show it, uh, to be part of you know, the, this new network. So we're in the middle of that as we speak. And, um, but, but I feel like this, this proud Papa that's not been able to show off his baby because mm-hmm. we have, we've been very patient. So we haven't done, uh, we just did DVD. We haven't done our, we're, we're going to do our subscriber video on demand, which is Netflix or Amazon. <clears throat> and then we're also going to do our down streaming, uh, iTunes type of stuff, uh, later on this year. So we're just taking it one step at a time, but, um, I just couldn't be happier with the amount of people that were involved in it. And the fact that we didn't use a narrator, we just let uh, we just let people. Everybody sort of passes the baton as they share his story. And um, in this case, it, it really it really worked out. Okay, so can you just put into layman's terms the process? Okay, you you, you screened it to all those in all those theaters in January of seventeen, and then and so then what was the next step? It, it was it trying to find people. I mean, you, I guess you alluded to it, but I'm just trying to make it make sure this is clear. So from that point, it's okay. We have to find a network of some sort to to broadcast it. That's right. Okay. That's right. We're looking for the right broadcasting partner, and uh, and and we we just felt like ESPN was was really. Uh, that, that's that's our audience. That's that's those are the people that are that are involved in college football. They're involved in in. Uh, in and fans of Florida State, fans of Bobby Bowden. So it was a natural, but um, but ESPN doesn't typically acquire documentaries like this. They like to they like to commission them, and they like to own them, and they like to control them. And in this case, we did we wanted to make it independently. We felt that uh, we felt like uh, we, we we wanted to tell the story the way we wanted to tell it. And I and I. I I've suffered network notes <laughs> for my, you know, for for enough enough decades of my career that I know uh, I, I I know how to tell a story. I don't necessarily need someone to to 
tell us how to make it any better. So we, um, and also Rob, Rob and Brian are very capable storytellers. So we said, let's just make our film. So we ended up making it two hours, which is kind of a no, no, <laughs> you don't do that. You don't do that for television. You don't usually want these things to come in around 95, hundred minutes, but, uh, we just, we just wanted to leave it all out there. And so, um, uh, so we did that with complete freedom. And then, uh, when we got it to, uh, when we got it to the ACC network and then they, they wanted to make it part of this channel. Uh, we, we just had to be patient. We had to wait for a bit. It took us about a year. It's been about a year and a half since we uh, first brought it to them, but we felt like it was it was going to be worth the wait to get the uh, to get more eyeballs on this. What is that year and a half like for you? Well, it's been, it's been fine. We've been doing screenings. We've taken Bob, Bobby came went to Atlanta. We had a screening out there. We went out to NASA and got a tour of all the facilities out there. And the local Seminole Club did a fantastic event there. Lee Corso came out. Um, so we've been doing that kind of thing and also, uh, selling the DVDs and Bobby's gotten, uh, uh, gotten into a lot of speaking, uh, as well. So, and we also did a screening at his, uh, at Samford university in Birmingham. So, um, you know, but, but again, I, I, I just, I'm, I, I'm just so happy to, to, uh, to hear you say things that, that, that you said earlier and, and to read the things that people are saying, right. Because they're just seeing it for the first time, but we've known all along what a special film this was. So. Did you know coach Bowden before you reached out to him, I guess, after, I guess, in, what did you say? 12 or 13? Yeah, yeah, no, no I didn't. Uh, I, I met him one time. We we both shared an elevator ride at the stadium, and I'll never forget it. I was uh, maybe a sophomore, junior, and I was going up to do an interview with one of the coaches, and he got in, and I think he had a couple of people with him as well. He says, "Hey, how you doing? How how you been? How's your day going?" And I said, "Just fine." And I, and I, I remember when he got off the elevator. I remember how he made me feel. Hmm. He made me feel like the most important person on the elevator. And that's what he does with everybody. So I never forgot that. And of course, he, I've been a fan and you can learn so much about life and management and leadership. Just, and, and there's been count, lots of books that, that have been written about Bobby's, uh, Bobby's career and his, uh, his biography and things. And so it's just one of those things that I, and I, and I met him, you know, I met him at a, at a couple of uh, golf events and things like that out here in LA. <clears throat> but, no, I certainly didn't know him, but I, uh, Jerry Cutts, uh, one of the people, one of the sports, uh, some of the boosters, uh, knew what I was wanting to do and arranged, uh, uh, like we had a meeting and I was just talking to him about the project and he was on his, he, <laughs> I was with, he was with somebody else and, and Jerry got on the, on the phone and, uh, I remember him looking over and said, John, you, you're around this afternoon, right? Cause I was in town in Tallahassee. And I said, sure. He goes, well, we're going over coaches. I said, are you kidding me? I'm not ready to pitch this yet. <laughs> but uh, next thing you know, we're driving over there, and he came out and just said, hey, come on in. And it just made me feel so comfortable. And I told him what I wanted to do, and I told him that we, the idea was to do this independently. The last thing you want to do is just you know, go to a network and say, we'd like to do this. And then they're like, okay, great. Here's how we want you to make it. And so he really, he really liked that idea of uh, – and, and so it took a while to put it all together and put the, the, the funding together. And, um, thankfully I, I, you know, I was in a Sigma Chi fraternity and during my years at Florida state and, uh, a couple of guys were interested in helping me do this. And so they, uh, they helped put the funding together and, and, uh, away we went. Can you give a ballpark figure? Uh, is that too private or? Yeah, yeah, you know, it, well, I can tell you, it's it's north of five hundred thousand. Okay. Yeah, and these things aren't cheap, and in fact, the uh, the the footage itself is also very expensive. You can easily uh, spend seventy five dollars a second for some of these um, some of these um, uh, games that were you know, back in the seventies and eighties. Oh, wow. for the rights. Sure, sure, yeah. So the archival rights is not is not cheap, and then also the way we did it, we shot most interviews uh, with two cameras, and and we, and, and we have we had an extensive reenactment package, so and a lot of travel, and it took time. Well, you know, you're not going to get Nick Saban when you want him. You've got to wait till the season's over, and and so, uh, but everybody from Mac Brown to Lou Holtz, uh, Lee Corso, uh, it really it, it, Mark Rick. Uh, Vince Dooley, it's kind of a who's who of college football. And um, so anyway, that and all that, it just takes time and, uh, and, and all that. But, but you, you, that, that budget is not unusual. That's, that's just what these things cost if you want to do it at a high level. 
one of the most fascinating parts of this is what you mentioned. If you give it to a network, and just again, going to, into layman's terms, I'm, I'm going to make sure I get this right. They pay you basically to walk away and then they take, they pay you for the rights and, then, right. and then they That's have right. con- total control, or I guess total control over how the movie goes. And you, you and coach Bowden and the rest of, and everyone else were, were like, no way we're, we're, we're doing this. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. And I, I've just been around the block. My first, one of the first shows I was involved in here in LA back in 1990, uh, it went 65 hours and, and we, we owned it and we were able to license it, uh, domestically and then foreign. And, and so I, I, you know, out of that experience, I learned to try to uh, try to retain ownership and uh, out of every most everything that I do, only because it's just um, it's 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 just you know it's kind of a, one of those fundamental things. That, you know, you're either working for somebody else or you're working for yourself, and I tend to like to work for myself. So, and just, I'm just curious, I mean, when you're interviewing Burt Reynolds, I mean, how the mechanics of that? Do you get Coach Bowden to call up? Bert and say, "Hey, we're doing this movie. Can you meet up with these with this crew?" Right, right. Yeah, you know. In fact, we you know we didn't lean on Coach for for anybody. All we had to do was tell people we were doing a project with Coach. Okay, uh, it was that easy. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and and also, I didn't I didn't get to go to all of the interviews that uh, Rob and and Brian had the fun of doing a lot of that, um, but. But no, there were that. It was mostly the the logistics, you know, trying to figure out and asking around and uh, and having to go through agents and all that. Yeah, that's it's just part of it's just part of what you do as a producer. So, and what did, did you learn anything? I'm sure you learned a lot that you didn't know, but I'm just curious. The most maybe the most I guess uh, profound thing that 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 you did not know of going in that you took away from it that you picked up through all the. Reporting well, and research and interviews. Yeah, that's 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 hard. That's hard to say because uh, I've just been involved in it so long. I would uh, I would say I was. Um, I th- I think I, I shouldn't have been surprised, but I've been surprised at how many people uh, connect with Coach Bowden and have and have a very strong opinion about or, or a feeling about something he might have done or said that affected them personally. And Coach is pretty much unaware of this. He's a little oblivious to it. But um, uh, so many people have been affected by him, either by through something he said to them or, or former players or, or people that watched him on television that, that admire him. Uh, and, and also, that I mean, you're talking about a guy who today at 89 is still signing footballs and still signing autographs and books and, and people will call and write and ask favors and this and that. And, uh, it's, it's, it's gotta be in the, in the, in the many, many, many tens of thousands of people have, uh, taken a picture with him or, 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 uh, or, you know, gotten an autograph with him or spent time with him or heard him speak. And so, um, yeah, you know, in fact, he's, he's speaking, uh, uh, this weekend and he just spoke the other night. And so he's still getting out there and he's, not to turn 90 in November. Um, so I, you know, I guess that I just wasn't, I, I, I knew he was popular, but I just didn't know the, le- the, the, the level or the, the depth with which so many people have a, have a strong connection with him because of what, what he, what, uh, how, how they interface somehow, you know, in the past 50, 60, 70 years. If you run a business that conducts credit card transactions with customers, you got to learn about Tandem Payment. Credit card processing company has offices throughout the Southeast, but the one in Greenville and the upstate, headed up by a 2005 Clemson grad, Tandem's technology allows business owners to offset their credit card processing costs by applying a small customer service charge to each sale they make. Tandem has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and was awarded the Better Business Integrity Award in 2013. Check them out at tandempayment.com. Big supporter of the Clemson Dubcast is Harris Flooring America, based in Anderson, South Carolina. Harris flooring has been instrumental in a lot of the facilities transformation you've seen on Clemson's campus lately from the Allen Reeves Center to the McFadden Building to Memorial Stadium to the Neary Center family owned and operated since 1947 the owner Scott Junkins big Clemson guy Harris flooring is just as good inside the home and the residential realm as they are with the larger scale commercial stuff give them a call 864-642-6183 or online at flooringamerica-anderson.com 
another sort of industry question. Um, okay, so ESPN, do they purchase the the right to show it, or do they like? Because I, I was listening to a podcast uh, that you and Coach Bowden did with the Osceola, I guess before the season. That's right. And and one of the things that really stood out to that is that you said ESPN and the ACC Network had the I guess the the right to to cut out parts as they saw fit and you 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 were just assuming that they were going to cut out some of the a couple of the parts that maybe not the most politically correct i guess one of the uh, one of one of the uh scenes where where coach bowden recalls um you know he, he took his he, he took his team to a white church and then he took his team to a, to a black church y'all thought that was not going to be left right. in can you right. just can you just give a explain how that process works and well yeah and this is this yeah and this is what they wanted to do they don't they uh they they made it they, you know in the negotiations we decided to uh uh give, give them the film and they're going to air it a minimum of 10 times two times on the espnu and then the rest and then then uh, the rest on the acc network and um in exchange, they gave us four minutes of advertising. And so what we decided to do, we talked to Coach about it, and we decided that uh, one of the best things we can do is set set up the Bowden Dynasty Legacy Project, which is uh, its goal is to make the film uh, uh, inexpensively priced for church and school and team licenses so we can get this scene as many places uh as possible. That's what Coach would just love this film to be something that people, you know, re- remember by 20, 30, 40 years from now. So, uh, you know, having said that, the idea th- then we also had to uh, we had to agree on on the format of the film because, as I mentioned earlier, it was two hours long in the theaters, and we had to get it down to about 105 minutes. So, uh, you know, taking 15 minutes out of the film, we had to decide what that was. And we just told them that we, you know, there are some things that were non-negotiable. There's some things we felt so strongly about the story. We didn't want to, you know, we, we, we just wanted to make sure that if we agreed on that, we'd, we'd move forward with the deal. And so they, they let me take the first crack at it. And, um, and yeah, there are some part. There are some parts where, uh, when Bobby's praying with the team, and and uh, there are some other stories uh, with, uh, with Mark Richt and things like that, where where you, I, I, I don't think, I don't think a network would have would have told those stories on the, you know, if they were given the the the, mm-hmm. the shot. I think a lot of networks would have wanted to, uh, you know, get into more of the dirt and more, more you know, more gritty details, more salacious uh, things that the aspects of, of uh, any football program. If you look hard enough for over 50 years you're going to find you're going to find some warts and things and we didn't want to do that we just wanted to tell coach's story and and uh and that involves the story of his faith well anyway the, the, to make a long story short they they didn't have any and, and they didn't have any issues with with what we wanted to keep in there so we were we were delighted and then we moved forward so what what can you describe the feeling of of after the after Coach Bowden watched it for the first time in January of 17, and he told you, don't change a thing. I mean, the fact that you told his story exactly how he wanted it told, what, uh, what's your reaction? Yeah, yeah, that was something. That, that really was something. In uh, October of 2016, we, uh, we, uh, got, we went to Tallahassee with the film crew, uh, Rob and Brian, and we watched the um, – we we got the student theater. It holds about two hundred three hundred eighty people. Beautiful theater, and we uh, Bobby came in with Ann and his oldest son Steve and his agent Rick Davis, and uh, we all sat down and watched it for the first time. And uh, we were all really nervous. And uh, uh, when it was over, we were all sort of standing up to the side. And Bobby comes out and was walking up the steps, and looks at all of us. He goes, "I just got one thing. I I got one thing to ask." Where's the bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> so I knew where it was. I said, Coach, I'll show you where it is. And we're we're walking to the bathroom. And he stopped me. He put his arm on mine. He stopped me. And he said, don't change a thing. Mm. I loved it. You read my mind. You read my heart. You read my heart. So wow. I'll never forget that. Um, and, and I have to say, he did not. You would think he would have been, you know, it's maybe it's part of his management style, too, where we talk about that as well, where he would let hire people or let, and trust people to do what they said they'd do. And he'd leave them alone, not tell them how to do it. And, you know, if somebody was doing a biography of my life, I'd like to be I would be more very interested in what they're doing. So I think he took a, I, I by by 
by not asking us every week how it was going. Uh, he, I think he took a chance as well, but um, uh, and he, there was a lot of trust, a lot of trust to trust your story with someone else. And uh, but we're both glad we did it. He just wrote just uh, yesterday to talk about how uh, how pleased he is with the with the, the the TV cut. He watched it the other night, and um, and it moves even faster. It moves even better. It's an actually actually it's a better film uh, at at night. At, you know, the shorter TV version, in my opinion. So, so it opens with, uh, it's at night and a couple is driving, I guess, through country roads. Uh, what, what kind of car was that? I mean, did you, did you get the car right? Exactly. The car. He, yeah, you know what? He used to do a lot of Ford Lincoln commercials in uh, Tallahassee. So I think we, 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 we tried, <laughs> we, we tried to get as close to it as possible. And the radio clips that he was listening to, I forgot exactly, was it when Ray Perkins? That's right. Ray got, Perkins stepped down to Alabama. Yep. Yeah, and uh, we, we just thought that we were, that, that was a piv- that was the biggest pivot that Bobby's career, Bobby took in his career one way or the other. And uh, we just felt like that was a really good way to set the, set up the story. And, so, then, um, yeah, and then you revisited yeah. it. Uh, were, yeah, we catch up to it. So, where did you th- those radio clips? How do you go about finding those? Well, those were um, those were uh, TV. Some of those were TV clips. Okay, that gotcha. were played uh, at that time, and uh, we we just we dug we dug really deep. A lot of the local uh, Tallahassee TV stations had had clips, and also we work with the uh, the athletic program. Mm-hmm. Uh, similar productions and and we were able to find a, a lot of i mean believe me we, we could have done uh, we could have done the uh, f- five hours on this if we wanted to there's so much material when you're talking about somebody who's in the media for so long and they, they make I- ideal documentary subjects in the f- in the first place because they're so well documented so and, and i am not a film expert by any means um but from my generalist perspective uh, the simplicity of the the opening scene where he's walking out to get his newspaper at four or fifteen in the morning or whatever, mm-hmm. and he's and he's eating breakfast and he's reading the funnies. I mean, that that is just so. That was who who came up with that idea? That's just so so cool. It, well, the the crew, the crew and I uh, were sitting around and we were talking about the day, you know what what can we do sort of day in the life, and we and uh, and I I forget how it came up. It's pretty but it, that's one of the things Bobby does. He has this sort of personal constitution. He gets up every morning around four fifteen, and he does exactly what you see. <laughs> you know, so uh, I felt sorry for the crew because they had to get there at you know, three in the morning <laughs> to set up. But they captured that live, and uh, you know, they coached him a little bit and and made sure the cameras were set up. But uh, uh, we didn't know necessarily that that his story about Beetle Bailey and and reading the funnies. We didn't know whether that would lead into the. You know, you, these things come up later. And, and Brian Goodwin is a is a master storyteller, and is a, as the editor, he really has the final say and and pulling the pulling these together. Um, so, so, uh, th- that's kind of how it came together. They stayed up early. I mean, they got up early and filmed that, that scene and, and film, we filmed a lot of other scenes that, that didn't make the film. But, and then, uh, one of the, maybe the most powerful is, is when he goes back, uh, back to Birmingham and, and goes into the house, uh, where, where he, where he both grew up and where he had, uh, rheumatic fever and was bedridden for, for a month um tell me about that process of 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 coming up with the idea to go back there and then the the you know all all the things that it took to to make that happen yeah well and that was just a lot a lot of producing a lot of just a lot of producing and coordinating my wife patty kelly uh actually drove bobby to birmingham for that particular shoot and uh, right now, an African American family lives in that house, and they were they reached out to them either the day before or after, and they they got permission to go in there. And as it turns out, uh, Patty was talking to the uh, to the mom there, and she mentioned that her son was play, was a football player, and he was fifteen. And Patty said, "You call it? Can you get him out of school?" She says, "Well, maybe." Patty says, "Go go get him out of school." Go get him out of school. Have him come home. Come home, and, and and she did. And after Coach Bowden shot that scene, he sat on the front porch and talked with that young man about football and what he could do to 
you know, get better and and uh, get a good chance of getting recruiting recruited. And Bobby signed a picture of, of those two later and sent it to him. And also um, also gave him his phone number. I said, if you ever need any, any advice, that's Bobby Bowden right there in a nutshell. So, uh, and then of course he was floored to go into his room and see there was a bed just, just the where, where his bed was back in the, in the forties. And, um, and that was the first time he'd been back to that house in, uh, I think 70 years, something like that. Were you there that day? I was not. Okay. No, I was not. I, I was in, uh, uh, I live in California. I think I was on another shoot at the time. I'm just curious what, how powerful of an experience that was for him. Well, it was, and he's talked about it a number of times since then with Patty and and myself because we we you know we've interact, we've interfaced with him on a number of different projects and screenings and things like that since then, and uh, he he just got a real kick out of it. And as a storyteller, you're always looking for something to kind of make the story come alive, and um, you know so so coming up with ideas like that, you know, getting the, the getting the pay, picking up the paper at four fifteen in the morning, reading the funnies, that's an idea. The, and going back to his home, that's an idea. Following him back to Morgantown, Virginia, there's another idea. Um, you know, following him to the Florida State when they're honoring him with the Bobby Dodd Trophy. There's you know so you know, you shoot as much of the stuff as you can. And, and one of the best moments we had, Bobby didn't re- ever want to go back to back to the stadium. He felt like when he's done, he's done. He didn't want to be one of those guys who, who was looking over Jimbo Fisher's shoulder as the next coach. And so he didn't want to go back, but we begged him to do so. And he agreed to, and it, um, it was, a, it was a real windy day. And we wanted to get all those shots of him coming into the stadium that you see at the end of the film and to kind of reconnecting, you know, going back and touching that rock, if you will. And um, it was a super windy day. In the last second, we were told that we had to call the FAA to get permission to fly our rather large drone uh, in and around the stadium. You don't just do that. You've got to get permission. And uh, I won't forget when the cameraman called, we we, we got on the speaker and the guy says uh, at the airport says, well, so what is this for? We said, well, we're doing a documentary about Coach Bobby Bowden. He's right here. And the guy says, don't don't go any further. You can do whatever you want with Coach Bowden. He built this town. Mm. Wow. But it was a windy day. We got him out there on the 50-yard line, and the, and the drone's going around and around. And, I'm just, and, and, of course, by this time, up in the offices, the coaches' offices, everybody's looking down. They're aware of what's going on. We didn't, we didn't make a big – you know, we didn't tell everybody what we were doing. We just kind of got, got some – got the permission but we didn't we didn't make a big big scene about it we just went and get, got the shots done but every at a certain point we could tell everybody was watching us and coaches back in town and you know, on the field that's named after him and uh meanwhile it's super windy and this this massive drone is flying around his head and i'm just saying please don't don't have an accident not here not on, <laughs> not on the 50 yard line no i don't want to <laughs> so um yeah, so and a lot of these things you you, uh, you shoot as much as you can. We did a reunion with a lot of, and a lot of the former coaches came back for a little reunion party surprise uh, get together for Coach Bad, and we surprised him. I think it was on his birthday, and uh, that scene did not make the film. It just it's just it, it was a wonderful scene, but we just had we had to cut it. So we uh, we we overshot, but we we put together a collector's set that included lots of things like a, a, you know the Kenny Chesney full interview and. A lot of the other, uh, a lot of the other moments that didn't make the film, um, just just so that if people wanted to see them, they were there. So when he had rheumatic fever as a child, uh, they said he might not live until forty, and he couldn't do any sports or anything like that. And then he was it he or his parents who wanted to get a second opinion? Can you uh, enlighten on that for the people who haven't um, who who aren't familiar with it? Yeah, yeah, that's that's what it was. He prayed. His 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 mom said, "Do you believe in the power of prayer, Bobby?" And and why don't you pray about it? And so Bobby did, and he, he kind of made a <laughs> he made a deal. He said, "Lord, if you will heal me, I'll serve you. In fact, I love to serve you through football. If that's what you want me to do." But it, with pure faith, he just he just did it that way. And I don't know the exact timing, but uh, they decided to go. Get, and also, time had passed. Uh, time had passed where, and back in those days, you just you just had to lay flat for for as much as a year or two years and hope that you know whatever it was that would pass. And um, when they eventually did get the second opinion, this doctor said, "Yeah, you can probably you can probably play football again." And so, um, so that began his his. his him getting back into the sport, getting back into athletics. In the meantime, he was playing music, you know, 
to pass the time. So he was able to to you know, re- rebuild his body, and then he ended up being one of the best halfbacks in town, and became a you know little All American. You know, I think a couple times uh, as quarterback. Can you describe what it was like? And, and you did y'all did a great job of capturing this uh, in the movie uh, of just like the blissful time of the late seventies and the early eighties when it was, everything was new and wonderful. Like you go to Florida and snap a 10 game losing streak to the Gators. And when you come home from all these big wins at Ohio state and, and, and other places, other big name football schools, people are just beside themselves and masses of people at the airport and downtown shutting down um shutting down the main the main drag there as a student there during that time what was that like because i mean it was from scratch it wasn't like you know resuscitating anything but but you know what it can't be that much different from clemson's because i was an undergrad when clemson won their first championship out of nowhere they get a perfect record and they you know they they win the whole thing and they must have been excited too and that's and back in those days we you know you watch the games in your dorms or in your apartments or fraternity houses or wherever you were and uh but you're not connected with phones so People would instinctively, and it's something that's, that happened that that, that, be, that happened several times, and it's one of my favorite moments in the film because, and I think for alumni, they see that scene and they remember. Everybody would go out to Tennessee Street, and the police would literally just shut down. They just shut down the street and just just call it what it was. It was a, it was just a a, a pop up party. And people were just so excited to say, we did it. Can you believe we did it? And became cause for, for a sort of a, you know, impromptu, you know, party. And then became, if we, when we did win those big games, people knew, hey, we're going to Tennessee Street and the police are going to shut down the, the street. And that's, that's kind of what happened. So, yeah, it's hard to describe those, those, those moments, but the, but uh, we captured a, a lot. Most of them are th- that I remember as an undergrad during those years, like Paul Prowski jumping on the ball at Nebraska. That was that was huge. Um, so there's just the, some of those, you know, some of those moments, the Oktoberfest and all of that that we talk about in the film. As a fan, you you just just it, you just started to buy in. It wasn't until as an you know when I graduated in '84, and then of course we all continued to follow the program. And when the dynasty began in '87. Um, it just got to be a whole lot of fun. It was 14 years of fun. And, you know, the thing I, I tell people, I, I, so can you imagine a team today making the final four 14 years in a row? Mm. You know, yeah. And Clemson's having a great run now. You know, Alabama's had a great run. But 14 years, really? With, you know, the same coach, really? Can, you know? and, and, you know, I'd love to say, you know, we say 14 years in the top five. It's more of a technicality. Actually, it was 13 years straight in the AP top four. Mm. And then the 15th, and then the, the 14th year, um, the AP had them, uh, number five, but the UPI had them four. So they, so, but they were, they were a top four team, you know, um, you know, for, for, um, 13 years, even 14, if you want to be technical, we say top five, just so that nobody comes, you know, nobody, nobody argues the point, but that's, that's what, how special it was. And, and you take it for granted, you take it for granted, and, and uh, but that that's what I wanted to make this film about. I didn't want to make it. Uh, I wanted to make it about those, you know, Bobby and how. I mean, how do you how do you pull that off? How do you you know how do you uh, how do you kind of break that down? And and and, and you know, it comes down to the players and the coaches, and but everything kind of comes down from the head coach. That's the way football works. So, um, so we wanted to focus on that on that on that fourteen year you know, achievement. And so that's why we call it the Bowden dynasty. It's not, you know, it's not necessarily about his, uh, his, uh, but, but there's a whole legacy involved in that as well. So, yeah. And, and that, that is funny. I got, I guess it was on the podcast with the Osceola, uh, coach Bowden said he didn't even realize it in the moment when it was happening. Uh, he never even really thought about it until after, uh, you know, the 14 straight years in the top five is when he became when he began to appreciate it. And then I think one of you, somebody, one of y'all mentioned, yeah, you know, Clemson has uh, whatever won 34 or 36 ACC games. Well, Florida State was 70 and two at one point in the ACC. And Coach Bowden says, really. That's amazing. Like, he, <laughs> yeah. he, you know, it's just it's great, like yeah, you said. Yeah, and you know, yeah, to, to hear him tell it, you, you know, they, they, of course, they knew they were on the roll, and they, and, uh, but you know, it, it's almost like when, uh, when a, when a, when a pitcher has a no hitter going, you don't talk about it. 
Yeah. You know, you don't, you don't, you don't talk to them. You leave them alone. <laughs> you know, um, it's, it's just one of those things that, uh, that, and then in hindsight, you look back and you say, wow, what an achievement. So uh, another really cool, uh, visual was when they went at Nebraska and the, uh, the Cornhuskers fan give Florida State a standing ovation as they're running off the field, sure and, and you hear Coach Bowden saying, "Thank y'all, y'all are y'all are too kind." As he's running off, that, yeah, that's no, amazing. That's great. Yeah, and not only that, that was a pivotal that was a pivotal moment for the program as well. You'll hear a lot of boosters talk about when they came back home. They all said to themselves, "You know, we want to be we want to be like like Nebraska." They learned from that. They thought that their fla- their fans were so classy. And uh, it's just something that, you know, you just you love to see and you, you love to emulate and you love you know, for people to think of, of you that way. What year was that? Uh, I want to say that was 1980 uh, or 81. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the, the play, any, anybody, anytime, anywhere, it's just it's so amazing looking back at that. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the 87 season. Michigan State and Auburn, where Florida State played, they both finished in the top ten. They weren't in the top ten at the time they played. They were they finished in the top ten. Michigan State number eight, Auburn number seven. Florida State went to East Lansing and won thirty one to three. Went to Auburn and won thirty four to six. That's just almost unfathomable in, in today's sort of definition of you know of what a schedule looks like you know what i mean yeah yep and 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 uh, like we say in the film bobby decided to get our name out there he would play anybody anywhere all on the road always on the road and people love to sign a one a one and done contract nowadays they everybody wants a one and one you know, we'll play you, you you play here and then okay we'll go to your place but this was these were all one-sided deals but that's how we could get we get the money get our name out there and of course none of these teams expected to lose at home and um, but that's when that's when they started calling Bobby the king of the road. <laughs> so I'm dying to ask you about this. One of the goosebump, most goosebump inducing moments for me was was uh, two, two moments in, in the locker room when uh, at halftime in the coach's locker room, you had Bobby preparing. He's trying to figure out what to say to his team. I don't know who they were playing, but you had John Eason and Brad Scott giving him advice on what to say. And you had Brad Scott saying something to the effect of, "Tell them, tell them nobody thought they could do this or that." And then it, yeah, that's right. and, and then it flashes to Bobby Powden telling his team, "They said you couldn't do this or that." And then the, I think it was against Miami on the sideline where a crucial moment of the game, and they're on offense, and it's like, "What play should we run?" And Brad Scott is saying, "I think we should do this. I think we should do this." And, and Coach Powden is saying, "Are you sure? Are you sure?" And so it really. It really illustrates just how much pressure, you know, in the moment is on, is on those headsets. You know, when you have the head coach bearing down yeah. on you saying, you better be right, and then it's right, and they're celebrating. How, first of all, is that in, an in-house video crew for the coaches show well, or something? Yeah, interesting, interesting you would ask that. There was a uh, producer, I don't, his name doesn't come to me now, He's, uh, he, put the, he put this together for um, – he put together a, a, a video one year. They followed Coach, and they mic'd him. He was – Coach Bowden was one of the very first coaches to be mic'd up, and that's a very popular thing to do these days. Back then, it wasn't – it was barely technologically feasible um, with wireless and things like that. It just wasn't – it just wasn't easy to do, and he agreed to do it. And they did it for, uh, for uh, I want to say, a whole season. I want to say it was around 85. I don't know exactly the time, but I can tell you that uh, – that there's a lot, a lot of people think that Auburn was able to intercept that that uh, the wireless communications during their, one of their games at home for some reason it was bouncing off the concrete stadium and there's a lot of folklore around <laughs> around that uh, around that idea uh, but it was one of the first way Bobby was one of the first to do that to let to let people listen in share the experience of what it's like and the conversations you have so as a producer. When we saw that, uh, when we saw that film, of course, it's pure gold. So we, we managed to, to work some of that. And he kept the mic on in the locker room, as you saw, and on, on, on the sidelines. This was an actual film that was distributed? Yes, yeah, it, was, it was done. It was done, I, I want to say in-house. Um, 
yeah, and yeah, it's it's an amazing film. It's something that they, you know, they they should probably, they should probably re- release it and let let everybody else enjoy it if they could. I'm I'm not sure what the what the ownership rights are on it, but yeah, it was it was done as a sort of an in house seminal production. Uh, okay, what's this guy's name? What's his number? I want to watch this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll send you. Uh, I'll, I'll send you an email. Wow. Yes. I mean, I, that is. That's just gold, like you said. I mean, that has to be just fascinating. How long is you? How long did you say it is? Uh, probably fifty minutes, maybe. Okay, I don't want to steal your yeah. thunder of your own movie, but but that's just um, just those little clips are just that's incredible stuff. No, no. In fact, I, yeah. Mark Mark Rudin uh, is went, he and I went to uh, communications uh, classes together. We both graduated from the communications school around eighty three eighty four. Mark stayed in Tallahassee and built uh, from scratch Seminole Productions, which is the uh, flagship uh, college uh, video production facility in the country. They were, he was one of the first. We were one of the first to get involved in in uh, preparing video clips and film clips, and then video clips for the coaches. And everything, everything else. Mark's still there, and uh, uh, and it was it was just it was a joy to kind of come back, and uh, and 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 with his cooperation, put this film together. Over the year we've been doing the dubcast, we've developed a great relationship with the folks over at the Abernathy Boutique Hotel. In addition to being a great meeting spot for our interviews we conduct with the local personalities, it's also a fantastic place to stay. The Abernathy is rolling out a loyalty savings program for 2019. After your third stay, you'll automatically be rewarded with an exclusive offer. It can be applied to future reservations for the remainder of the year. 15% off rooms, 15% off food and beverage at Taps Bar and Cafe. Learn more at theabernathy.com. Quick word word about Uptown Realty LLC, headed up by Patrick Enzer, former sports writer who decided to get into the real estate game. Uptown Realty locally owned and operated out of Sumter, but they serve the Eastern Midlands and PD area with the buying and selling of homes, commercial properties, and land. They also offer affordable new housing in the mid 130,000s from a local custom builder. Patrick is the sole owner and broker in charge. Grew up in Anderson, going to Clemson games, been in Sumter for 15 years. Loyal Tiger Illustrated subscriber, loyal Dubcast listener. Website is UptownRealtySC.com. So 86 was when Ray Perkins leaves for the NFL and Alabama is pursuing Bobby Bowden, correct? Yeah. And just for the people who aren't aware, he was ready to go home. And he told them he wasn't going to interview, that that if he interviewed, he had to be assured that he was get, that he was the top guy. He shows, he shows up and there's a collection of a bunch of people who are there to, I guess, interview him. And then he—that's the big factor in his decision to to stay at Florida State. What a, an amazing, pivotal juncture, not just for Florida State but college football as a whole. The history of college football. Like, what would be different? Um, and and I mean, what was—is that your biggest takeaway too when you sort of explore that part of his story? Well, that was yeah. Well, that was yeah. It was a big pivot point, and it's uh, it really it turns the film into a new direction when he does that. Um, and that's when, and the, and and the, and the thing about it was, nobody knew it then, but the the minute he made that decision, that was day one of the dynasty, mm. and that because everybody bought it. He's our coach. We're going to play for him. So people stayed around for the summer. They all practiced extra hard. They had great players coming in. Deion Sanders' class was on their way, and um, so it was it was just you know that key moment. And then later on, Alabama did offer him the job. Uh, straight up later on and by that point Bobby felt like it was, it was just that Florida State was his, his place so was this in the 90s uh, he'll tell you he'll tell you but uh, I, I want to say it's, it was uh, yeah I want to say it was sometime in the 90s okay yeah he said on that podcast that both Alabama and Auburn uh, came after him and I think I, I think he said the 90s I don't want to misrepresent what he said but uh, that's uh, really interesting um, yeah you talk about the pivotal juncture there you know with Dabo uh I don't know if there will be a pivotal juncture in a similar you know with similar I guess gravity because I think he's staying I think Clemson is going to be his his final coaching job but the pivotal part would would be back in in uh in 2006 uh when when uh 
Alabama was looking for a head coach and they went after Rich Rodriguez. I think Nick Saban had told them no. And so then they go after Rich Rodriguez, who was at West Virginia. And Rodriguez wanted the job. And he calls up, uh, I think Rodriguez's agent calls Dabo and, and asked if Dabo wants to go to, to go back home and be the, I guess, the co-offensive coordinator or whatever. And Dabo says, heck yeah. And his bags are packed. He's, he, he's going to Alabama. And Rodriguez had told Alabama that, that, uh, that the, the only way he, was, he would not go there is if the news got out before he told his team at West Virginia. I don't know if this is 100% true, but that's the story I've heard. Well, the, the, the news leaks out before that, and then he pulls out, and then Dabo ends up staying at Clemson, and then two years later, he's the head coach. So that if, if, if there will be a movie done on Dabo at some point, and that would be the pivot point, I think, or it'll end up being the pivot point of his – uh, of his career, uh, coaching career, as it yep. relates to, to Clemson. Yeah. And by the way, the name of the producer who did that Bowden film where they mic'd him up, his name is Gary Jordan. Okay. And uh, just, uh, yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree with uh, with uh, Coach Sweeney. And, we, and, and he and Bobby are, are aligned in a lot of ways. And you, you, you can almost argue he's part of the Bowden family tree mm. that, you know, Tommy hired him and, uh, and uh, there, Dabo told me a story about when he once, <laughs> I think uh, Tommy and him were in Tallahassee and they brought him by Coach Bowden's office. And and then Tommy says to Dabo, he says, you know, I, um, I got to go do something down the hall. I'll be back in a little bit. And he leaves <laughs> Dabo alone in Bobby's office. <laughs> and at this point, I think Dabo is just a graduate, graduate assistant or something. He's just kind of making his way through coaching. And, and here he is being you know, left alone with this legend. And Bobby ended up just being the nicest guy. And they had this wonderful conversation. But, it's just, you know, it's just, it's, again, it's how he makes everybody else feel around him. He, um, you know, he's just got no ego. So uh, it's just you know it's a neat, it's a neat story. As, as a matter of fact, when we did the uh, the nationwide one night only theatrical release, we did that in St. Petersburg, Florida. That's where we had a red carpet premiere. So it was a live event. You, you saw the red carpet. You saw uh, we had sixteen hundred people in the theater. Then we did they showed the film, and then we showed we did a Q and A with Coach Bowden, and then we we signed off to the rest of the country. It was a, sort of a live live uh you know whole a whole live event but we began that with our mc uh showing a short clip of what happened earlier that day and what happened was uh that morning we went over to tampa and at a church bobby bowden gave away every year they give away the bobby bowden award to the college football player who uh who exemplifies some of the best ideals you know character and things like that and um that year deshaun watson got it so i had <laughs> pinch me but i'm on the front row of the of the church uh with dabo and deshaun watson and coach bowden and coach bowden talked and they had dabo come up there and and uh, then we spent some time in the green room uh, before and after that and i got a quick interview with dabo talking about coach bowden and uh you know those are goose 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 goosebump moments for me such such respect for dabo sweeney and what he's been able to do um you know and, and you, you know Six years ago, Clemsoning was a verb. You know, yep. now now nobody wants to be Clemson. I can assure you. <laughs> <laughs> so to see him and see how he built that that program through sheer will uh, is amazing. And and also, I was in a meeting with um, the day that the, it was about three year two years ago when Jimbo Fisher signed Marvin Wilson. It was his last class. Uh, I went to a, an event that they have in Tallahassee when the coaches introduced the people that they, they signed. It's, national, it's a way to recap National Signing Day. And Coach Fisher told everybody about what's going on in Clemson and these wonderful facilities we have. And, and he said, guys, you might not want to hear this, but there's an arms race going on, and Clemson's doing a really good job out there. They're attracting some great players, and uh, you know we need to be cognizant of that. And that that particular argument uh is what uh is one that was one of the re one of the things that uh that was a, a little bit of a breakdown with the the boosters and they didn't necessarily see eye to eye on that but uh but uh, jimbo's uh jimbo uh, definitely was aware of what was happening and of course now everybody's aware and the, and the one thing too that was fun about being with uh coach uh coach sweeney and uh, deshaun that morning was the next day they went out and won it all and they beat mm -hmm. they, and the last play of the game. You can't get more storybook than that. So, as a college football plan, I play, as a college football fan, if it can't be FSU, it might as well be a program like Clemson. Uh, and I enjoy a good team. I enjoy good coaching. I enjoy great players and great plays. And so, um, 
that was just especially gratifying. Also for the ACC, you want the ACC. You know, it's, it's not our team. You know, at least for, like Virginia winning the the basketball championship last year. You just you love it to be, you know, you love it to be in our conference. It can't be us. Well, it's like the the Bowden era and the and the Dabo era. It's like they're kindred spirits, um, not just with the Bowden connection, you know, Tommy Bowden, of course, but it's just very similar um, in, in the you know the the faith based part of it, uh, the the human and, and personal form of of leadership that they have, uh, the way both of them cared for their players, and, and I couldn't help. Well, I, actually, I say this. I think about a year ago or so I was I think it was Andy Staples I was doing a podcast with and we were talking about that similarity and 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 my my thesis is is Dabo is the new Bobby Bowden and and while I'm watching this movie the other night and then last night I'm thinking this this is gonna be what the Dabo movie is gonna look like except just probably with a few more uh, more championships and that's nothing against you know Bobby's yeah. resume he was having to face a <laughs> a tougher regular season for sure uh than, than Dabo has so it just really I think that's one of the reasons that it that this this film really uh really left such a big impression on me yeah yeah and also you could say and then this is one of the reasons we think it's uh and we've already heard we it's been when when we we do hear back from coaches and and schools that show it to their players and uh, in fact, uh, Willie Taggart um, has the film, has the freshmen watch it when they come into Florida State now. He wants them to be aware of their heritage and where they're coming from and the people that went before them. Um, but uh, in, in a way, it's a little bit of a coaching clinic, too. You can see the movie and from that through that lens, um, the, the, just the way the Bobby coached his coaches, the way that they established the family atmosphere where he wanted all of his assistant coaches to come to dinner on Wednesday nights and bring their wives and their families and their kids. So the, and then the players sat down with their coaches, but now, you know, they might've been getting uh, coached earlier that day, might have even been getting screamed at, but now they see their coach as a, as a husband, as a father, as a human. These are, you know, these are just masterful management uh, and motivational ideas. And, uh, and something you hear that Dob was doing a lot of that at Clemson, you know, and, and, uh, and, um, and, uh, in the film we mentioned, one of the coaches talks about how are you going to, how are you going to dismantle Florida state where well, you, you know, you're not going to beat them on talent, dismantle the staff, the staff starts to leave, you know, mm-hmm. this, uh, the, the, you know, and, and keeping the staff together was, was a real one of the, another secrets about success. Who was your favorite interview out of all of them? Oh, that's a tough. That's that's a tough one. But I would have to say, I have to say, Warwick Dunn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was really good. He, he, to go from to go from the situation where he was, where he just turned eighteen, and his mother is is, is killed. You know, as a off-duty police officer, and she's killed. But because he just turned 18, he has custody of his five siblings, mm. and uh, and they're all younger than him. And and uh, and then he, you know, if that's not enough of a weight, and then he comes to Florida State, and they pair him up with uh, with you know Charlie Wood. That's one of my favorite interviews. Of course, the Mark Rick interview is uh, is is as good as it gets. So, uh, yeah, you can't, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to, you don't want to name your, your favorite your interviews, but certainly favorite moments of the film. Those are, those are two of mine. Did you, uh, did you try to get Steve Spurrier? Uh, I have to say that there are two people that turned us down for the film and Steve Spurrier is one of the two. Really? <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's not, it's not for any, any, you know, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't read too much into that. Some of these people are just too busy, and they're be, they're asked to do stuff every day. But um, that's okay. We managed to we managed to include Steve in the film, and uh, <laughs> during the sixty four game when he's getting sacked. Uh, so. I was going to add earlier. You talking about the importance of, of staff uh, continuity and stability. Also, you mentioned at the very beginning the rap video before the. I guess that was eighty eight, or was that eighty? Yes, yeah, uh, eighty eight game, Miami yeah. game. It really um, reinforced the the importance of humility uh, because they 
you know, they spend all summer working on a rap video, and then the first game, you got to go to Miami, yeah. and Miami's sitting yeah. there just eating it up. Yeah, and we were the first. Uh, it was the first year we were preseason number one, and now, now, and and Clemson knows what that feels like now. You yeah. know, and then that year, yeah, we were first season number one. Bobby goes to Europe, and the team decides to put together a rap because the Chicago Bears had just done one. You know, people forget that, but that was that. And they were doing. They were trying to be like that, and. um uh, but when it's all over, in fact, I was down in Miami when that when we lost thirty-one to zero. I'll never forget it. And um, but uh, right after that, in the film, uh, Coach Nicky Andrews says, "You can't talk your way into a national championship. You got to mm-hmm. earn it." So uh, it's just another one of those lessons. And what I love about this film is that there were so many setbacks. There's so many setbacks, and in and, and any good movie, you have a you have a, your hero, and you have a, and you have the hero's you know, goal, and and you've got the protagonist and the antagonist, and then you've got a series of setbacks usually in any good story. Well, this is all real. All of this happened. So uh, you know the wide rights and the wide rights. You can't make that up. But the fact that Coach Bowden kept going, he didn't didn't quit, didn't go to another school, he just kept going, uh, and then end up getting this, this, having this amazing payback, this amazing payoff. Um, that's you know that's just what makes a good story. So I, I would tell people I'm doing this thing about Coach Bowden. It's 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 mine to screw up because the story's already there. You know, it's not like we're trying to write a story and make all the like a fictional thing. This is all real. It's our job to make sure that that we tell it in such a way in 90 minutes. You know, and get the right bites from everybody else, which is, which is challenging. But you know, it really was ours to screw up. Another really cool thing was was the stuff that nobody remembers. The casual college football fan doesn't remember the wide rights. Uh, Ryan McGee of ESPN noted they had just moved the hash marks uh, a little farther outside a wider and so which created well actually no, they, they kept the hash marks wide but they moved the goal oh, i'm sorry in. yeah i got that wrong yeah, yeah but it created yeah. uh funkier angles for the kickers wiki and angles yeah yeah and you don't want to use that as an excuse i mean florida state just won on a on a wide left last week and uh miami just lost last <laughs> week on a <clears throat> miami lost on on a wide something uh last week so you, you don't want to use that excuse but that that it's just another one of those factors that's not always in the coach's control. It's just one of those things that all college players at that time were dealing with. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that, that you'd like to to share? Anything I haven't asked you about that, that, that maybe you think needs to be brought up? I would just say that it's, uh, you know, if people are interested in, in uh, learning more, seeing more, go to BowdenDynasty.com and, um, and uh, you know, we have more background on the film and things like that. But I just uh, I hope that that coach uh, gets to see more and more uh, just more feedback from teams that see it, and uh, from more fans that see it. He's we we spoke yesterday morning. He was just really happy with the premiere that we had on uh, just the other night. It's airing right now as we speak. It's going to air tomorrow. Uh, I know this is a, your podcast is recorded, but they're going to they're going to be showing this uh, many times. It'll have a CSPN U premiere on um, on the twenty eighth of uh, of uh, this month, and so uh, I'm not twenty second of this month on Sunday at seven p.m. So. Uh, you know, if you can't see it on TV, you know, maybe uh, you know, come by the website, share it with your team. It's just one of those stories that comes along every now and then. And and um, just you know, for me, I'm just happy to be to be able to, you know, kind of pull it all together. And uh, and then uh, our, our job is done. The film is done. It's it, we now it's uh, it's fun to see people talking about it online and saying how much they enjoyed it and how much they got out of it. And uh, so. That's, that, that's all I would just say. The, the, it, it is something that that hopefully will be around for a long time, and and coaches and athletic departments will be using it as almost a uh, uh, I call it a coaching clinic. Well, you and everyone else who worked on it should be so proud. It is is uh, it's a it's a gem, and uh, I could watch it over and over again. And in fact, I think I'm going to watch it again uh, when it when it uh, when it shows again tomorrow. So, um, congratulations and thank you so much for sharing so much of your time with us to, to share more you, information about it. You betcha. Yep. And, uh, again, as one Florida state fan to a Clemson fan, uh, we, 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 uh, we know good football when we see it. It's not, we, we'd like to see it more 
on our field, but I can tell you there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, mutual admiration going on. We I don't think we even consider you guys rivals. You know, um, we consider Miami rivals. We consider the Gators rivals. <laughs> but uh, I, I'd look at the Clemson game as like, boy, but just you know, I hope we can, hope we can match up. Hope we can you know, hope we can win. But um, it's fun to see uh, another team, especially in the ACC, doing it, doing it so well, doing it so right, and uh, kind of the uh, the flavor of the month. Well, good luck to you uh, for the rest of the season, and uh, hopefully we can keep in touch, John. Yep, you got it. Thanks. All right, thanks so much to John Corey for joining us. Man, such great stuff. Cannot recommend uh, that documentary enough. What a what a fabulous trip down memory lane. Maybe we can get Bobby Bowden himself to come on sometime and, and to share his thoughts and recollections about it. But but thanks to, to John Corey for, for taking so much of his time to, to share with us. Thanks to all of you for listening. Thanks to our very generous sponsors, including title sponsor Parham Smith and Arch and Hold Law Firm in downtown Greenville. We'll be back next week as usual. Everybody have a wonderful weekend. Cheers.